Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Unlock the Door. This is your host, Michael Cross here, and what I'm striving to do here is just get people to think for themselves. To question authority, as Benjamin Franklin said, was a cornerstone of democracy. To be able to look past the rhetoric and look into issues in great depth, which is something that it just seems that most people aren't really doing nowadays. You know, I'm reminded... I'm reminded of a quote from George Bernard Shaw in which he said that only around 2-3% of people really actually think. And I would hope that the people that listen to alternative radio, that listen to this station and this program are in that 2 or 3% and not part of the big mass of, oh, what's the sports score this week or you know what's Miley Cyrus doing right now and and that sort of thing so you know beyond the introduction there I'd like to get into the main topic of the discussion and that is I would like to address for the next hour the topic of eugenics now I would like to deal with what eugenics is by definition uh, what its history is where it might be currently and some of the controversies that I hear on you know the radio, alternative radio especially and then what its future is because I think it does have a future and there's a lot of things that are going to uh, be involved in this and this century this 21st century is the one in which we're going to see the greatest innovations that mankind has ever seen in regards to his or her very being. And that's why I say eugenics is going to pop up, but it's going to be different than it used to be. Now, eugenics is nothing new. Uh, first of all, it means basically applying, well, you could say scientific or just techniques that farmers use on their livestock, but applying selective breeding um, or encouraging other people to breed more in order to make the human race better. Now there's two forms of eugenics. Uh, sometimes we don't hear uh, that in alternative media. Uh, one of them is called positive eugenics. Now positive eugenics is something that basically says you take a look at the people who have really good traits. The kinds of traits that you would re really want to see more of in your society. And what you do with those is you encourage the people that have them to just have more kids. You know, to just, you know, basically uh, instead of not having kids or having one, two, three, you know, one or two kids, to maybe have three or four or more kids. Now, that was a technique of eugenics, you might say that was promoted by such people as, well, Teddy Roosevelt, for one. Teddy Roosevelt uh, would, you know, he would, he, oh, let's back up a little bit. Teddy Roosevelt believed that people that were healthy, uh, intelligent, people that had good morals and so forth, those people should be encouraged to have larger families because they're going to make more people that have those kinds of traits or at least you'd have a greater likelihood of it at the very least you're going to have people raised in homes where there's a strong work ethic uh, maybe patriotism um, the desire to do good and to uh, treat each other with respect so he thought those kind of people should have larger families uh, although he didn't employ any techniques to try to get people that weren't intelligent or healthy to have smaller families. And that's called negative eugenics. Negative eugenics is where you zero in on people that you really feel, for one reason or another, are not very desirable. And you try to get them to have smaller families or no families at all. This is where you get into the issues such as forced sterilization. Uh, some of the proponents of this kind of thing thing was uh, Margaret Sanger who was a contemporary of Theodore Roosevelt and those two just did not like each other whatsoever um, Roosevelt would go and promote such ideas that uh, I think his ideal family 
he thought for an American, the ideal for the ideal people, obviously, was uh, six children. And he felt that no success, not even being president of the United States, could equal being a good father and mother and having uh, children and grandchildren who were respectable people. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how he felt. He didn't look at it from a socioeconomic basis like uh, many of the uh, people that are, are sometimes associated with eugenics, uh, the social Darwinist, who usually tended to be more negative eugenics oriented. Um, back up just a little bit there. It's hard to deal with these issues just on a linear perspective. They, they're all interwoven, and sometimes it gets confusing, but social Darwinist were people who applied Darwin's views, and we'll get back to Charles Darwin here soon, but they, they applied Darwin's views on natural selection, but they took it on to human beings, and they tended to believe that all people uh, who had made it big, had all, they were the ones that demonstrated good genetic quality. Those people who were poor there had been, and he felt that, I mean, the, the social Darwinists believed that there was uh, ample opportunity over the last few hundred years for the, the sifting to take place. The social Darwinists believed that the poor people had already demonstrated that that was their place, that they were in, if they were poor, they were also genetically inferior. And so there's where you, you get more of the social Darwinistic thing going into the whole negative eugenics uh, doctrine. Whereas someone that would support positive eugenics, such as Roosevelt, uh, he could see a, a family living on a little dirt farm in the Appalachias who were good people and were bright and so forth and think that, well, that person should have a large family. He didn't think that you should... Uh, look down on those people, whereas people like Sanger, who said that the mer most merciful thing a large family does to its infant member is to kill it, uh, and also praised eugenic measures that were based on um, the idea that poor people just had to be kind of um, erased. The, the thing is that that was more of an elitist standpoint. So the thing is this. And before we go into some of the basic uh, historical background of eugenics beyond that, social Darwinism tends to be oriented towards negative eugenics. Um, the ideas of forced sterilization, those kinds of things that became law in the United States up until World War II when understandably it became a little bit politically incorrect to support these views uh, because of Hitler. He gave it a bad name, although that seems to be fading away as time erases all memory, uh, you know, basically of World War II and, and the whole aspects that Hitler supported these kinds of things. Um, the thing is that the positive eugenicist people are the ones who basically say, well, yeah, you know, don't discourage people that are bright from having kids, and they should have kids, and it doesn't matter what their economics are. Okay, now let's back up just a little bit here. I said that this is nothing new. Well, this goes all the way back to Plato. Now, without going into Plato in too much detail, in the Republic, he speculates the perfect utopian society would be one in which you had a division of peoples, an elite, uh, more of a, more of the military class, and then underneath them would be the basic workers, uh, proletariat. Um, but by that, he didn't mean the people that did the dirt work because in his day that was done by slaves and they didn't really count as people. But the people who, well, they might own a little sandwich shop or something like that, or people, basically professionals uh, of all sorts and small business people. There'd be three classes of society and the highest one would be one in which the would be made up of the brightest people and these would be like philosophers and i guess if you put it into modern uh ways of thinking scientists and technicians and and uh social scientists and so forth but beyond there there 
this is this is where it gets into kind of an X Files type thing. If you remember back to X Files, where there's that little shadow elite, and it also has a BF Skinner sort of uh, of um, aura about it too. You would have the Guardians, and the Guardians would be people who would basically protect the society and really run the society from behind the scenes. And the Guardians would be from the super smart, uh, super elite, basically. They would be – they would work behind the scenes. They would make sure that there was not that much change in society. You might have democracy. You might have various people running for government, but there would be certain types of people that come from the – the ones that you liked. the So there wouldn't be much of a change. All these people would have been raised in universities and so forth in which they would have been taught the ideals that were coming from the Guardians in the first place. So it's sort of like I, – I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but it's sort of like when you had the election back in 2004 in which you had John Kerry, a rich dude. And George Bush, a rich dude, uh, both with uh, both with really high uh, Ivy League educations, and both belonging to like the same fraternal orders, such as uh, Skull and Bones. So the thing would be that no matter who won, it would be the same people really in charge. And then, of course, when we see in 2008, you wound up with um, you wound up with Obama. Who kept everything that Bush put in in regards to economics and when it came to the surveillance state and those sorts of things. No change. If any change, it's actually gotten more extreme. And that's that was uh, the ideal that was set by Plato. But he goes beyond that. He believes that the Guardians, for instance, and this is something that was copied later by Hitler. At least he tried to get his SS members to do this, but – really with very little success because they were still steeped in tradition. Uh, the idea would be the Guardians would not only uh, be these ideal supermen of the society, but they would also uh, – it would be considered a real honor to have children with them. So they would be breeding out there. They wouldn't marry. They would just go out and you know they'd get someone pregnant here and there and there and there and there, and this would bring up the – genetic quality of the society. Now it's hard to say if maybe uh, he got his eugenic ideas maybe from Sparta, which even though they didn't go into the philosophy as much, they did have a eugenic policy. And that was if a child was born and it didn't fit certain health criteria, it would be um, eliminated. They'd just take it out and leave it out in the wild and, and you know let nature take its course. So um, I think that Plato and – Plato did get some influence from the Spartans, but it basically this was eugenics. The, the, uh, the uh, Plato society that he wanted would be based more on an intellectual eugenics, whereas the Spartans were more of a warrior uh, ideal, build strong uh, warriors. But also they, they, they advanced education as well, but – Ultimately, it was a warrior class uh, civilization. I will note, though, before people start thinking that there's a lot of um, – that you, know, you kind of look down on warriors and so forth. A lot of the ideas that got into the forming of our republic in the United States were based on Spartan ideals of equality and the – at least the land owners and so forth being involved in decisions that affected their life. Now – we go a little – let's go a little further here. Um, of course, there's been other societies that have employed um, eugenics to certain degrees, but I want to jump ahead to more familiar times. Now, in the early to mid-1800s, you had some major influences by such notables as Thomas Malthus, a reverend who uh, mostly didn't really preach the um, – the gospel of Jesus so much – at least he's not known for that in history, but more of the idea that humans breed too much, that 
eventually humans wind up like lemmings that they will grow beyond their resources and then things collapse of course lemmings they all migrate by the thousands and then they come to the ocean and everyone thinks oh they commit suicide no they don't do that they don't know the difference between a body of water being an ocean or a little pond they jump in to try to swim across to get to new territory of course that's impossible for them to do so they drown but i mean the thing is that malthus believed that human resource extraction meaning food minerals and so forth could never keep pace with human reproduction so you would have a situation in which people would have lots of babies but each generation they would have less and less and less to go around and eventually society would implode you'd have sort of a uh, the walking dead except no zombies it's just everyone would start eating each other and during this same time period i think you know while this influenced actually a, a young uh, minister slash botanist named Charles Darwin, who uh, who felt that this was the cornerstone maybe of how uh, ecology stayed in balance. You had a constant battle between animals within the same species and also against each other to survive, and they adapt. So you get the herbivores like rabbits who they don't really have any real natural defenses but have never gone extinct because they breed so fast and of course most of them are eaten except for maybe the healthiest ones the cleverest ones who survive and then pass their genes on and it just continues on and on and on the you know foxes uh, and so forth the healthiest of them are able to catch rabbits and eat them and survive and then reproduce the ones who are not so clever or the ones that are not so healthy they die and they don't reproduce now malthus of course believed this applied to human beings and a lot of times you'll get apologists that when we're talking about eugenics they'll say well darwin really wasn't into eugenics um i would i would tend to disagree with that if you read his book descent of man which i have um, you'll find that in there he speaks a lot about human evolution. I'll get back to that in just a moment, but, but first I would like to talk about uh, Sir Francis Galton. Sir Francis Galton was Charles Darwin's cousin, actually twice over. Seems like the, the Darwin clan had a thing about marrying close family relatives. In fact, um, Charles Darwin married his first cousin. Now, the thing is that Sir Francis Galton, who's known for such things as uh, setting the stage for psychometric profiling, uh, he uh, was the one who pretty much introduced the idea of fingerprinting into the uh, Western culture. And he's known for a lot of other things too, but the thing that he's mostly known for is being considered the father of eugenics. Because you see, he looked at Malthus and his cousin Darwin looked at their theories and felt that if you're going to have this struggle for survival then well nature has a has its rules you know if you're weak you die if you're not very bright you die um, so such things as speed cleverness uh, strength um, immunity to disease these kinds of things kept your species alive and continuing and maybe even adapting and evolving into stronger uh, subspecies of that animal. Now, Galton recognized that civilization tended to have a way of getting rid of that. You see, with civilization, we, we tend to feel bad if people are laying in the streets dying. We feel bad if people catch a disease and well they die of it so we try to find cures we don't have an attitude that when you have a child that's sick you think well yeah but if they live they'll just pass on these weak genes and both darwin recognized this as well he said it was part of our evolution deriving from sympathy that then was projected onto um mankind in general and galton 
though, felt that it was somewhat negative in the sense that what happens over time is the people maybe that are least fit wind up breeding the most because if you sacrifice time, if you sacrifice getting married when you're young and starting a family, maybe you stay in school longer, maybe you're striving to get businesses going and stuff like that, then by the time you do reach your sexual maturity or you know, you've, you've gone through your sexual age of reproduction – I'm looking at mostly females. Men can reproduce throughout their whole lives, but then again, most males marry within around 5, 10 years of the age of their wives, so – even though they can reproduce, of course, they are also hindered by the biology of their wives. The thing is that the more educated classes were the ones who tended to have smaller families, even in the 1840s and 50s. The less educated classes tended to have bigger families. And this concerned Galton. He believed that what should be done is a twofold approach. And he combined positive and negative eugenics. He felt that the educated classes should be encouraged to have more children. The less educated should be discouraged. Um, I'm trying to think of a model for that. Well, Sweden up until 1973 had a policy such as this where much of their social benefits when people get married and can take off like a year and a half after the birth of each child – and still be paid most of their income. Um, much of that had to do with the appeal to people that middle class women might decide not to have as many kids if they uh, if they lost economics. And so, to reduce the opportunity cost, the Swedish government decided that. They would implement a lot of these uh, social reform measures, these maternity leave measures and so forth in order to get the upper middle classes and the middle class women to continue having children as opposed to if you look at a lot of societies around the world, once women reach the middle or upper middle classes, often they have few if any kids compared to the other classes. And at the same time, Sweden had uh, well a very draconian forced sterilization program that often was handicapped by the fact that it not only looked at traits such as well if someone's uh, in a mental institution or a, a criminal or something like that or has a really severe genetic disease, but tended to look at things that might be like you know you show a lot of rebellion. You know, young women who were very rebellious against authority. Uh, sometimes they were sterilized uh, because, well, rebellion in Sweden is considered really a no-no. It's a very conformist society. So Sweden did that, but other countries have done that to a certain degree too. Now, back to uh, let's go back to Charles Darwin here. Since often people, you know, if, if you if you see something on the internet discussing evolute, I mean, um, eugenics, and someone brings up Darwin, underneath you'll see people making comments that Darwin never believed in this stuff. Darwin was only talking about evolution in the species and competition bet between species. Well, if you read Origin of the Species, then I got have done that one too back in college. Um, yes, that deals with um, – that deals with uh, species fight for survival. But if you read his later book, Descent of Man, then you see he gets into a lot more details about human evolution. In fact, in that book, he goes so far as to, to say that maybe the, the, the bubonic plague – that wiped out a huge chunk of Europe a few hundred years ago might have actually had a positive effect. And you're probably thinking, what? Well, the people that did survive, and it's actually been shown if you study history, the people that survived tended to be healthier, had less disease afterwards, and tended to have a higher birth rate. So, you know, I mean, but do we need a play? I mean, you know, you're, you're looking at, well, what's the 
you know, do you want to have a plague in order to, to do that? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a biologic, it might be biologically true, but still, I don't think that we're willing to get rid of vaccination. Darwin talked about vaccination, maybe not being such a good thing because then weaker people survive and pass their genes on thereby weakening the next pop, the next generation. Darwin also talked about the, the problem with having standing armies because he felt that with an army, then you usually exclude men who had problems, health problems, mental problems, and that sort of thing. Well, what do you do when you do that? Well, you take the healthy guys out and they get all shot up and killed in battle. And the unhealthy ones, they stay home and have babies. <laughs> so Darwin thought that was pretty nasty. That was not a good idea. And finally, though, he did say that maybe a lot of these, a lot of these societal problems when it comes to preserving biology could be negated by the fact that less healthy people, more criminally predisposed people and so forth – tended not to marry as often, so therefore they didn't pass their genes on as much. Uh, many of them wound up in jail or executed, so they didn't get to pass their genes on as much. And uh, you know that maybe some of this got some of this got corrected that way. Well, who knows? But the thing was that Charles Darwin did look at human biology and he and his theories did encourage, people in regards to eugenics because eugenics basically says let's not just look at this and go oh my gosh you know human society is going to collapse someday into kind of a state of the movie idiocracy but maybe what we should do is try to correct that maybe we should try to encourage people again you know to, to have bigger families if they're good people and have smaller families if they're not so good people so we get through Galton, Darwin, and this influence during the 1800s. Well, in the early 1900s, there were several countries that started adopting laws that supported these, um, these ideas. Now, one of them was the United States. The other one was Great Britain. Now, there was a variety of others that you don't even really think you, – you wouldn't think of. Uh, Mexico, Japan – um, much of Europe passed these kinds of laws. The interesting thing is Germany didn't actually get into the whole eugenics thing until much later. In fact, to a certain degree, the Germans through such things as the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and stuff like that, um, they didn't really start getting into this practice until um, like the 1930s. Whereas a lot of other countries were were already you know underway, there were laws there were laws in the United States for forced sterilization in many in most states actually, um, and sometimes these laws would deal with people who might not be criminals, they might just be people who you know you find a family out in the middle of nowhere, and it wasn't just applied to blacks it was applied uh, to whites as well. In fact, the vast majority of people that got forcibly sterilized were white. So, um, it, whereas, you know, the subjects here, there was a racial component. Maybe there was, but the thing was, the majority were white. The, the thing is, you find a family out in the middle of the Appalachia somewhere who they didn't really display much brightness in the family, the kind of the stereotype that a lot of people have. Which is unfair, but you know some people have a stereotype, especially the people on the East Coast towards people that live in the South. And you know, local governments were encouraged to force everyone to get sterilized in that family. So it wasn't just the insane asylums, the prisons, and so forth. It was this was pretty radical as it was applied. Now the the thing is that as as the you know the, when the uh, when the Nazis started gaining power, uh, it wasn't that they came up with these eugenic ideas; they just went ahead and and took them and adapted them 
In fact, Hitler even said that he was inspired to a large degree from American eugenic laws. And the thing was, though, that they went to the real extreme. I mean, the idea of eliminating people, getting rid of people, um, going around with mobile units that would gas people who were um, mentally or physically defective. And it didn't matter what race they were or anything. They were, they were just, uh, you know, they got a death panel and they were, um, they were erased. And, of course, we know what happened with the concentration camps in which Russians and Jews and all kinds of groups wound up being uh, eliminated. And the, the one thing I will note about that is it sort of was ironic that it – that if you actually looked at the educational levels of the people that wound up in these concentration camps, they were usually uh, higher than average. So the weird part was that Hitler, even though a lot of people think, oh yeah, he was dedicated to uh, eugenics, at the same time he was killing off a lot of the people who were the best and the brightest in the society when it comes to education. But the thing that, that seemed to see that made Hitler unique in one respect was the fact that he looked at a race ideal. Now, I'm not going to go into de – in a later show, I'd like to go into this kind of weird mysticism that Hitler was in that uh, inspired him. And uh, only one component of this New Age philosophy of his, uh, going back to ancient civilizations and so forth, was really you know, eugenic. But he did have an idea that he, what he wanted to do was return to um, this golden era where he – they would – even the Nordic people he thought were inferior, that through selective breeding you could create this superhuman being with telepathic powers and, and um, somewhat of a, a, a very, very advanced human. I mean if you want to think of an analogy… This, this is kind of unfair to Lord of the Rings yet, but the closest thing you could think of with an analogy would be uh, where you have you have the dwarves, you have the hobbits, you have the um, you have the uh, elves, and you have the humans. Um, the elves are presented as this – they're a, ra a distinct race or a species of people, but they are quite superior. They live – they have like almost immortality. They're fast. They are. They are not affected by disease and all these. Other, and, and they're. It's implied they're also telepathic. This is what Hitler wanted to return to. He wanted this kind of um, elf-like uh, human in the future, and he would get rid of all the rest. The, the human beings as they exist today, even his Nordic ideal, were just a stepping stone to get back to this ideal. But anyway, no matter what his philosophy was, you know, he lost the war, he uh, was trounced, and eugenics kind of had to slough back into the cave. It wound up being a very negative um, concept to start for like until about the 1980s. It was very politically incorrect to talk about intelligence health and these kinds of things as being genetic it was it was seen as uh, something that was akin to racism even if you weren't dealing with race you know if you started saying oh yeah maybe the reason why certain kids do better at math or certain kids do better at science or or, or better speakers or or whatever is due to their genetics no you had an uproar you know oh this is this is wrong you know the the the, the ideal society, one with social egalitarianism, everyone can succeed as long as they apply themselves. Well, there's only one problem with that, and that was the countless studies that were being done on genetics that seem to point to determinism in the sense that genes do mean a lot. And I think a lot of people have that same notion. I mean, come on, the average person, if you had to go to a sperm bank in order to have a child, if you're a woman, or if uh, your wife's sterile and you decide that 
you're going to get an egg donation. If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, yeah, I just, you know, I went down to Walmart and found someone that would donate versus, oh, yeah, uh, we went to, um, I don't know, Harvard University and visited their, their medical department and got one of their top students to donate. Um, come on. You know what 99% of the people would want. They would definitely want the um, person that was the smartest, the healthiest, the most athletic, and so forth. And so therefore, you would have that choice. But still, still, very unpopular to bring these things up until recently. Now you see more and more studies in which we talk about genes contributing to this. Now, that reminds me of something the Chinese are doing right now. This is very interesting, actually. I was reading an article that the Chinese are trying to determine that you know, they've, they've looked at thousands of people who volunteered some of their DNA. And these are people who are top like Nobel Prize winners and scientists and mathematicians and or people just known well, creative, you know, maybe artistic, these kinds of things. And they've taken volunteers from Europe, North America, and China. And they've wanted to see what – they're trying to find out which gene patterns seem to be associated with all the good things happening with kids. And the idea is that in the very near future – and if you ever saw the movie Gattaca, this will probably remind you of this. You'll be able to take a whole bunch of embryos. You, you, know, you give a woman some – medicine, uh, Clomid or Pergonol or something like that, get her to ovulate a whole bunch of eggs, and then you fertilize the eggs with the husband's sperm. And then you can take a little tiny bit of DNA from all of these developing embryos and determine which one is the brightest, or, you know, brightest and healthiest in the whole group. Now, this differs from genetic engineering or from eugenics because any couple can do this. It's just that the law of averages would be done away with. You would instead – it wouldn't be like you know a couple that's both mathematicians. They have a kid that can't even add and subtract very well. That happens, but the probability is significantly lower for that couple uh, as opposed to maybe a couple that you know are both really bad at math. Well, the thing is that the Japanese would be able to look at those cells, put the one in that's the best, then that kid would be you know, produced, and maybe the next generation and the next generation, you do the same thing. And voila, maybe in a few generations, you've got you know, these kids that you know, without having to s apply selective breeding – and sterilizing people, you wind up with kids that are, you know, have IQs of 160, 70, or 80 who are athletic and social and all these wonderful things. This is what I think is going to come into the future. This is the future I'm, I'm seeing because the more we learn about the DNA and the more we learn about what genes do what, the more we're going to want to tinker with them. Right now, we are only at a stage where we authorize such things as, well, so-and-so has this disease or this disease. Let's get rid of it. And, uh, you know, you go in there and you splice the gene out and replace it with a healthy gene. This has been done already, and, and in, that ger in that germline, you eliminate the disease. So those kids will have kids, and those kids will have kids that will no longer have that genetic disease that may have run through a family since – who knows how long. So I think that's going to be one of the big things that we're going to see in the future. And I mean, face it, a lot of times just regular screening will give you these kinds of results. There was a study just a few years ago on lesbians that have children. And it's found that most of their kids outperform other kids when it comes to academics and sociability and so forth. The thing is that a lot of people, of course, sociological type people will say, oh, yeah, it's because they have two loving mothers who are there for them and showing them a lot of nurturing. 
I didn't see very – there were a few mentions in articles of the idea that these women usually get their – you know, the lesbians usually get their babies through donation, through sperm banks. And sperm banks are extremely selective on who they allow. Um, I, some, of the, some of the sperm banks only allow like 1% of all the men that go in. And you know most of the men that go in, they're not going in there like, well, uh, I think I'll go donate. You know, I mean, these are guys that probably are sure that sure that that they're going to be selected. Then they go in, and after the screening, all the screening and and so forth, one percent make it. And that's some, you know, not all of them are quite that strict, but quite a few are. And so then, of course, the women that go to these places are going to be, you know, getting men that are healthier and stronger and so forth and it seems to be borne out in, the, in research I've seen that which children born from mothers at sperm banks are healthier and the study with the lesbians and so forth you know that their kids do better so this could wind up becoming something that we start seeing more and more of especially now we'll say this I don't know what it is is it the plastics in the food out there is it the uh Lack of exercise, stress, alcohol, tobacco. What is it? But men are losing testosterone. This is not, this is not going to be one of those ads you see sometimes about how to boost your testosterone with our vitamin. No, I mean it is – study after study is showing that males are losing their testosterone. And on top of that, that means sperm count is going down. Male sterility is going through the roof in the, in the, in the developed world. Are we going to see a situation in which eventually, you know, that we're going to see a very significant portion of the married couples in the United States and Europe, if they want to have kids, will have to go to sperm banks? I mean, I think it's a, a strong possibility. Now, there's the one area you do have eugenics. You know, you, you really do have eugenics employed. Uh, to be an egg or sperm donor, you you have to be at least, you know, above average. You know, if you're looking at the A B C D E, I mean A B C D F grades, if average is C, you're going to have to be an A. It doesn't mean you have to be an A plus 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 plus, but you're going to have to be an A to donate. And so, you know, you're producing maybe 10 or 15 additional children with your DNA. And that is one area where you do have eugenics, even though it's not – I mean it, it, it's not something that's instituted by government. It's a voluntary thing. No one forces women to go in and, and do this. <laughs> now, the thing is, it, this is where we sort of get into now this idea of what's going on in the world nowadays. Do we have some sort of eugenic thing going on? This is – this gets controversial, and it can go several ways. Now, if – in our economy today, and a lot of people believe that a lot of our economic um, – a lot of our economic evolution is actually not truly um, haphazard. It's actually planned. Then if we take a look at what's happening in culture today, we may wind up where we do create different subgroups of people based on biology. I've seen these uh, articles that speculate in a thousand years we'll have something akin to – we'll have like these almost perfect individuals. Um, this is – and this is without any of that Ray Kurzweil singularity stuff. This is just biology. This is not talking about genetic engineering. But just through uh, breeding, you're going to wind up with with um, you're going to wind up with two classes of people: a super elite and a mass of people on the bottom. Now, the thing is that we see the middle class kind of dying out, and this is one thing that's really, really sad. Uh, and this is where economics and society and biology intersect. The people who are at the bottom socioeconomically, maybe they're on welfare or something. I don't know. But when they find out they're pregnant, 
they may feel like, oh, wow, that's kind of inconvenient that this happened at this time. But if they're working at a low-wage job or they're on welfare or something, it's kind of like, well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, They go ahead and you know, it's like, okay, nature gave us a kid. Um, the rich, of course, they don't have to worry about how much you know money they have and so forth. Yeah, you know, they may have other factors involved, you know, like playtime and stuff like that. But their their fertility, at least, is not going to be affected by economics. Now, the group that's going to be affected the most by economics is the middle class, the average person who, you know, even college educated, but they have jobs that you know they get by. They live in the suburbs and so forth. Those people, when the economy goes flat, are the ones who tend to flatten out in their birth rate. They suddenly stop having kids because they're like, oh my gosh, you know, we can barely make it right now. Um, they're the ones that are going to be likely to get an abortion or be using some sort of birth control, maybe even permanent birth control like sterilization. And so these people who... I would argue have the same IQs or whatever as the elite. They will, they will often just stop having kids, and that's not very good because the the thing is the elite have. I was listening to the speaker. I I'm, I'm not going to quote him verbatim, but I'm just going to paraphrase him. But he's an expert on society and so forth, and he's made a lot of controversial statements in the past. But he said that nowadays we have a really interesting situation in which we may have a concentration of the smart genes in the upper class. So after a few generations of the really smart kids, even if they're poor, winding up with scholarships, they go on to get a good education. They wind up then marrying into the other people who have these good educations. I will note that nowadays most people marry people with the same education and the same background they do. In the 50s, it was different. You know, when you had the stratification, you had, uh, often a man would marry um, a woman. A man who was a CEO of a corporation would find no problem marrying a woman who was his receptionist, um, because women really were not expected to be high up in the corporate world. Nowadays, you usually find that a corporate leader is going to marry someone who is at least equal to him. In most respects. So therefore you're going to get a concentration of genes in that group. In the poor groups, you're going to wind up with a concentration there too. Now I'm not saying these people are inferior in any way, shape, or form, but if the IQ is significantly lower in these groups, maybe the reason they're poor is because they didn't make it as, as, as well in society. They couldn't become doctors or something like that. Um, then you won't see any upward mobility in that sense if we just look at IQ. Now, again, I'm just talking this speculation. Um, but the middle class, you're already seeing it contracting. In every single country in the Western world, you see it contracting. Now, there may be an exception when you look at countries like Russia, which really strongly encourage people to have children um, nowadays. Uh, but in in the in the Western, in in countries like the United States, uh, this is the, the, a lot of the a lot of the children of the middle class are not even bothering to get married anymore. They're not bothering if they do get married to have families anymore. When you have national magazines, I call them garbage magazines, but you know those kinds you see at the newsstand that you know that that get quoted a lot in the in the mainstream press. Where they're talking about, oh, maybe the ideal the number of kids is zero if you want to enjoy life. Well, the thing is that this is just creating this culture that is looking negatively upon children. And so what you may see in the future is this kind of um, – Again, it's, it looks like it's going to look like a science fiction movie where you have like you know you have well I mean in some ways I mean the science fiction show that's out right now the Hunger Games where you have um, this elite that live in these glorious cities and then you have all the poor people barely making it out in the countryside 
and if they do try to do things like go out and poach food because they're starving, um, they could face execution. So that's a possibility there. But I, I tend to think that what's going to happen is at least amongst the people who still have money, who still have opportunity, you may see a uh, when when these genetic uh, choices become more and more wide widespread, and people see that it, they can have healthy children this way. I think people are going to start upgrading. They're going to start saying, you know what? I want my children to have perfect eyesight. I want them to do good in school. I want them to be really good speakers. I want them to be social. I want them to be everything that they can be. And these people will – in this technology, you can't make it illegal because some country is going to have it legal, and people will just go to that country and have it done. I get a, I get a kick out of people who are pro-abortion will come out and say, well, if you – you know, back in the days when abortion was illegal, people just went to countries, you know, where it was, you know, richer people when they didn't want to have a kid would just go to countries and have an abortion where it was legal. Well, the same, you know, some of these same people will then be the same people that say, well, this kind of stuff, it goes against social egalitarianism, so it shouldn't be allowed. People should not design their kids. Well, <laughs> the thing is, the logic they employ on abortion, people are going to go to, you know, if China allows it, they're going to have a thriving biotech industry. People will flock there for this kind of technology. And then this is just going to advance more and more and more to where we can get rid of – people will go in and get rid of obesity. They will uh, they may want to have blue eyes. I've talked, to, I've talked to several people of like Turkish or Arabic background, and they're like, that'd be so cool to have a kid with blue eyes because you know that scene is so beautiful in 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 our countries because it's not very common. And I'm like, well, you would go in and do something like that? I mean, I'm not sure it's the majority, but you know, the people I've talked to, and they're like, oh yeah, why not? And so I think this would be true in all countries. Maybe people would like to say, oh well, yeah, let's design our kids to have this hair color, this eye color. Uh, I'd like them to be this tall, that tall, whatever. It doesn't matter what country. People are going to want to have perfect children. And maybe in a hundred years, after like four generations from now, this will just be common. In fact, you'll look at someone that doesn't do it, and you'll be like, you let your kid be born naturally? Now, of course, this this also is going to intersect. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on this. This is going to intersect with the singularity ideas, the transhumanist ideas, the application of mechanics to human beings to where you know people are going to start getting brain implants and all manner of other little uh, innovations and when they do then one wonders how this will affect the whole biology i still think people are still going to want to have the higher biology uh, and be natural you know have natural intelligence but this too is going to magnify us. It's going to give us all kinds of choices. You see, human beings, it used to be there was a lot of things we just took for granted. Husband and wife get together, they have a kid. You know, I was I was I was talking to someone today. They know a woman who she couldn't have a kid. She's a lesbian, uh, but she was infertile. So she got an egg donor and a sperm donor from Russia in order to have a kid. That's kind of interesting. Think about that. There's a guy in Russia and a girl in Russia who've never met each other. Their DNA has come together, and in another country, their child has been born to a lesbian mother. That's really, you know, the these kind of, these things were, were unheard of 30 years ago. And now they're becoming common. We are getting into an era in which the old eugenics is going to be so passe. It's gonna be it's gonna be like, you know, whatever. I mean, perhaps. And maybe this is what will actually create a certain level of egalitarianism in the society. Because I don't know, maybe instead of having the elite uh, having children uh, who are gonna be genetically enhanced, and then later when they get older they'll be mechanically enhanced. 
maybe what will happen is this technology will become widespread and and poor people will avail themselves to it and eventually everyone will be made equally high when it comes to IQ and equally able to access all these brand new technologies that's going to come along. I don't know. But the thing is, it is interesting that even assumptions of gender. I was reading an article the other day. Um, again, this is on transhumanism, but you know, this guy was saying that gender may become something that's a a choice in the future. And I don't mean someone goes in and has surgical this or that or whatever. I mean you could program yourself with nanotechnology, go in, get a shot with some nanotechnology in the future. You're a man now, you're a woman now, whatever, and then in about seven years, your body will become fully functional the other way because your DNA will be altered slowly but surely. Or maybe you know, you'll know, be able to remove the brain of a person and put it into a synthetic body. And if you put it into a synthetic body, uh, then you can choose your gender. You can choose your race. You can choose everything about yourself. It'll be you in the in your brain if we're going to assume that the brain is the seat of you know that human computer that the soul works through. But still, you know it's everything that we assume this day in 2013, everything we assume today is coming into question. And tomorrow, it may wind up that. Um, the world, everything, What you, you become an adult and you can just suddenly decide, well, I want to do this or this or this and I want my body to be this way or that way. So, you know, when I hear, when I hear people talk about the rebirth of eugenics, um, I don't think it's going to get back to that era where we are, we are taking some people and sterilizing them and other people we are uh, giving all these wonderful technology, you know, we're encouraging them to have kids. I think what we're going to have is we're going to have a, a situation.